I think that what joy means is like sharing happiness. To be happy and have peace with other people, even though if you're en if you're enemies. Um, giving and loving God. Fairies and God. <laughs> because they're magical and they can fly and they be the only one. Uh, spending time with my friends, doing Beyblades. My mommy and daddy. Well, we are invited into an amazing, beautiful, powerful partnership with the God who made us. And as we talk about what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit, we're talking about this partnership. And the thing about a partnership is in an authentic partnership, each partner has their part. I mean, in a partnership, each partner has their part. They have something that they're doing. And when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, these things that God longs for you and me, and they happen to be the very things that we most long for ourselves. It just happens to be that the very things that God wants for us the most, we actually long for ourselves. It's just getting to the place where we're growing in these things. And the fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, these, these fruit that God wants to partner with us in seeing grow and blossom and expand in our lives. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are all things that we long for and that we want for and that God wants to see grow in us. And what the Bible is telling us is that when we join this partnership with God, when a person comes to the cross of Jesus Christ and confesses their wrongs and their sins and accepts the gift that Jesus gives of his forgiveness, of his love, of his healing, of his strength. When we come to that relationship, God says, now my Holy Spirit moves in you. You become my person. And God says, I want to grow these things in you. And it just so happens that you also are longing for love, for joy, for peace, for all these things, gentleness, self-control. We long for those things. And so today we're talking about joy. And we're going to think together both about the source of joy, how God does his part to bring us joy, but we have to do our part to partner with God to walk in that joy. And when we do our part, and God's already doing his part, we discover joy growing in our lives. And, and sometimes we have this posture of just sort of saying to God, okay, God, okay, God, make me joyful. Okay, God, bring me joy. It's all you. But it's, it is a partnership. And I love uh, the book of Philippians, this short little letter in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, we're studying the book of Philippians all year long, all 2019 on our nights of worship. The first Wednesday of every month, we meet right here in the worship center at 615 for a service, and we're going to have baptisms, and we're going to have communion, and we're going to sing songs of praise, and we're going to pray together, and we're going to share fellowship with each other, but we're going to study the book of Philippians all year long. And what's so amazing about the book of Philippians is it is the most joy-filled book in all of the Bible. And the guy who wrote it, the Apostle Paul, is expressing joy all through it, and he's in jail. He's imprisoned for following Jesus, and he still has joy. See, sometimes we think that if life is difficult, we can't have joy. Here's the problem with that. If we never have joy when life is difficult, we'll never have joy. Because <laughs> there's always hard times, and there's always people close to us who we love who are going through hard times. And so God says, I want you to walk in joy. I want to see joy blossom and grow in you. And, and, and we need to choose to partner with God in joy. So let's start with God's side of the equation. You know, why have joy? Because God's done certain things. And here's the first thing I want to think about. Why joy? <coughs> why joy? Because God is showing off through the beauty of his creation. We can have joy because we worship a God who is extravagant and amazing and is showing off through the beauty of all that he's made. I remember I was with Pastor Dennis on, on one of our mission trips, I think it was, and uh, we, were, we were at, El, in El, I think, El Salvador, and uh, we, were, we were somewhere where we were, we were watching the sunrise, and it was so beautiful and so amazing, and De Pastor Dennis's response was, man, now God's just showing off. <laughs> it was just like, it, it was extravagant, it was beautiful, and even if nobody had been watching, God would have been doing it, because God loves beauty, and God's, God is creator, so there's times where God just shows off. If you ever go out on, on a night where it's really dark, 
Maybe you're up in the mountains or somewhere where all the lights are off and you look up at the sky. You might not get quite this view, but you get some kind of a sky view like this. Take a look at this. You know, where, where you can, you, when you, have you ever had one of those moments where you look up and you just go, wow, look what God has made. There's, there's, there's a beauty to it. Uh, or, but then also the beauty of God's creation gets much smaller. It can kind of hold in your hands and maybe pet like this. And you go, oh, you go, Look, look what God made. Look at the beauty of God's creation. And, and God loves to lavish his goodness on us. We live in an area right along the coast. So we get to see scenes like this. You get to see the ocean and sunrise and sunsets and the beauty of what God has made. And we should just stop and say, God, what joy you bring through, through the beauty of all that you've created. Now, I, shot, I, I showed a kitten, so I have to do e equal time here or I'll get in trouble. <laughs> and so... You know, a festive Christmas puppy. But, but, but the, just the beauty of what God has made. And, and there, there, are people who, there are people who see the glory and the beauty of God through their little puppy dog or their cat or their pet, almost through almost anything else. I mean, they, they see God's glory and God's beauty and they find joy in those gifts. Or even something simple as, as fresh fruit. We're talking about the fruit of the spirit. But just, just you think about the flavor. You know, when, when God was making, he said, okay, I want this one to be orange and I want it to be juicy and sweet and refreshing, you go, that, that's, that's God's creativity in big ways and in small ways. And, and, and just because my wife is born and raised in Holland, Michigan, is a good Dutch girl, you know, the beauty of flowers and plants, you know, just, the, the, just each flower different, each one beautiful. I don't know if you notice coming in that we're getting some of the plants set where they're going to be in our new courtyard, and I'm already just going, oh, it's going to be so beautiful. But God's made it all. So, so, so God, God is being lavish. You know, Psalm, Psalm 19, verses 1 to 2, says this. Psalm 19, 1 to 2 says this. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. And night after night, they reveal knowledge. You can see that in those images. You can see that around you. God, God is just lavishing us with things that ought to bring us joy. But, but along with the visual things we see, there's also the tastes and the smells and our senses that come alive with all the things that God has made. Uh, my wife Sherry and I were... We were actually with um, leaders and church leaders in Alaska for the last week. Since we saw you last Sunday, we spent a day traveling to Alaska, three days teaching, eight to ten hours a day, training pastors from all over Alaska. We found out Alaska is double the size of Texas. It's a big state. And pastors from all over Alaska gathered together. We trained them for three days, and then we came, took, took a day traveling home. So we pretty much, that's what we've been doing. And I will let you know, my throat is a little raw because we, I don't usually speak all week long between Sundays, but I did this week. And so I'm going to hang in there if I need to cough. It's not, I'm not sick. I just, my throat is a little bit worn. But, so, but at the end of all of our trips, when we go and do this kind of training and teaching, we pretty much are working all the time, but the last night we usually go out and have a dinner together. We just have a nice dinner together with whoever's part of the team. And this time Sherry and I were the team. So we went to this little restaurant called Ginger and we got a meal. And she, you know, each of us picked a meal that fit us. I'm going to show you a picture. Sherry actually took a picture of her meal because I'll tell you why in a minute. But, but um, I want you to guess. I, well, now you know I told you Sherry took the picture. I gave it away. This, this isn't what I chose. This is what Sherry chose. It's tofu and quinoa salad. <laughs> and sure, that sounds great to me. But, um, but that's what she ordered for her meal. That's what she wanted to eat, right? And so while we're sitting there and eating... You think about just our senses. Now, God's made things so wonderful. Sherry, I don't know if you've ever seen that scene in What About Bob, where Bob is eating corn, and the whole time he's eating, he's going, mm mm, mm mm, mm mm, oh, Dr. Marvin, this is, oh, Faye, this is, and he's just, you know, the whole time he's just making noises while he's eating. This is what my wife is doing while she's eating that. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, she, and then she took a picture of it. And she does not a big social media person. She wasn't posting it for her friends. She took a picture for herself. Anybody know why? If you're, if you're like my wife, if you're a cook, you know why. She's breaking, while we're, while we're eating, she's going, okay, wait, okay, wait. Um, there's basil, they got basil on top. And she's going, okay, there's red cabbage, there's red pepper, there's ginger, edamame, mango. And she's, going, she's like breaking it down, each flavor. And she's, and why? Because she, she wants to make a salad like that and re-enjoy the taste of what God has made. God, God lavishes us with sights, with flavors, with smells that are beautiful and wonderful and that bring joy to us. And you know, when God was creating the heavens and the earth, the very pinnacle, the very apex, the very top of all that God made, the thing that God made that he was the most delighted in was actually you and me, was people. And people ultimately are God's greatest creation and should bring us the greatest joy. And, and so as I was thinking about this, and while we were in Alaska, um, my, I got, I got a, a little video clip that somebody sent me, and I promised myself 
when I became a grandpa, and I did about six months ago, you were not going to see pictures every week of my grandson. I was not going to talk about my grandson all the time. But I want to show you one thing. Uh, <laughs> and so this, I want you to, because I see joy, and it brought me joy. People bring joy. I want you to, it's, it's subtle, I want you to watch for it. Okay, I want you to watch the screen and watch for the, the joy. Okay, just try to pick it up. Here we go. Okay. Watch for it. Look at the eyes. Look at the face there. Okay, it's building. We're getting there. Okay. Oh, watch now. Why? Oh, oh. Come on. Come on. Are you, are you, it's subtle, but are you, it's subtle, but are you seeing it? A little joy there? Okay. I mean, that's joy for him. That was joy for me. I hope it brings you a little bit of joy. Some of you, some of you are actually going in your mind, you're going, they should make one of those for grown-ups. If I could just go home after a long day of school or work and just like bounce for about 10 minutes, I would, I would be a joyful person. But, but God puts people in our lives, and those people can be a source of joy. Sometimes challenge and pain, I understand, but also incredible joy. If we're going to walk in joy, we recognize that God is the one who's lavishing us with joy. Why joy? Because the Spirit of God is in us. Joy because the Spirit of God is in us. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, we read these words. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. It actually goes on to say you're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your physical life. Glorify God in your body. The Bible teaches us that when a person comes to the cross and receives Jesus and confesses their sins, and they're washed clean. The very spirit of the living God moves into us. Some of those moments where you, you, you find yourself wanting to say, where's God right now? You say, wait a minute, no, he's right here. He's in me, he's with me. And if it doesn't bring you joy to know that the God of the universe loves you enough to move in with you, you're missing the point. The Bible says that God no longer dwells in buildings made by human hands. He dwells in us, a living temple of his presence. That should bring us joy. Why joy? Because God has spoken and he still speaks. And his word is powerful. God has spoken through his word. God, God, God didn't just sort of make the world and put it on his axis and give it a nice spin and say, hey, have a nice eternity. I'm out of here. God didn't do that. God speaks to us. Through his word. I love in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, the apostle Paul writes these words. All scripture, all of the Bible, beginning to end, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting. We need that sometimes. And training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Man, if I can encourage you, if you want to find joy, Open this book every day and read it. I'm so glad you're here for worship, and I, I hope you come every Sunday, and I hope if you're out of town, you go to another Bible-believing Christian church and visit there and worship there, be part of that congregation for the day, and then come back here when you're back. I, I hope you do this every week, but I hope you don't wait till next week to hear God's word again. I hope, I hope that you pick up your Bible, and if you don't have one on the way out, go to the Connection Center and just say, uh, I need a Bible. We'll give anybody a Bible for free who wants it. But I hope every day you can open up the Bible and read it. We actually have a reading plan on our website and in your bulletin every week of the year, every week till Jesus returns, so we can make it easy to say, here's a part of the Bible I can read that'll make sense to me and it'll get me ready for next Sunday's sermon. If you're not sure where to start, start there. And, and so, so I look at this God's word and I say, you know, how, how is it that I know? How is it that I know that God sees me like a good shepherd and he watches over me? How do I know that? Because Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. God's word teaches me that. How do I know that God is my father? Because the scripture says we can call him Abba, Daddy, an intimate word of connection. How, how, how do I know that, that God says I'm your friend? How do I know that, I, I, that I'm actually a friend of the living God? Because Jesus said, he said, greater love has no one than this, than they lay down their life for a friend, and then Jesus died for me. I know all that because I opened this book. This book brings me joy because it speaks, it speaks truth and life and hope into my soul every single day. Open this book, let God speak to you, and grow in joy. Why joy? Why joy? Because perfect forgiveness and grace are freely offered 
Perfect forgiveness and perfect grace are freely offered to us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It is so clear that God says, I give you forgiveness. I give you grace. And it's a gift. It's given freely. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. And if we understand that, that the amazing grace of God is ours as a gift, that should bring us joy. As Sherry and I were training uh, pastors and leaders in Alaska, um, she shared part of one of the sessions that she was teaching about this that reminded me of this, just a simple way to understand the greatness of God's grace. It's really by looking at three wonderful theological words, justice, mercy, and grace. These are true power, three powerful words. You know, justice, we all know justice is getting what we deserve. You know, and we, we all want justice if someone's wronged us, and if we did something wrong, none of us want justice, because uh, justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. You do something wrong, look, give me mercy. And, and then grace is getting the good things we don't deserve. Now, I want you to imagine this. Imagine you're driving around somewhere, and you're, and you're not paying attention to, to your speed limit, and you're, you're, you're 15 miles an hour over the speed limit. You see the police car behind you. You hear the siren. You see the lights. They pull you to the side of the road. You know you're in the wrong. You know you were speeding. You know, you, you know you're caught. They pull you over, and as the police officer's walking up to your car, what are you praying for? Are you praying for justice? <laughs> no. You know, oh, Lord, please, let them give me a ticket for the full speed over the speed limit and the full, no, nobody's, you're praying for mercy. I don't want what I deserve right now. And so if the police officer gave you a ticket, that would be just. If the police officer didn't give you a ticket, that would be mercy. But what if the police officer looked in your car and said, you know, your car's kind of run down, and I see you got some rust spots, and it doesn't look like it's running very well. And the police officer says, this is kind of strange, but just yesterday, I bought a brand new car. It's my first new car ever. And I just feel like I want to give it to you. So here's my address. Come to my house tomorrow, and I want to hand over and sign over my new car to you. That's crazy. <laughs> that would never happen. That's grace. That's grace. We've sinned against God. And in his justice, he pays the price through Jesus. In his mercy, he does not punish us. And in his grace, he says, I love you. You're my child. I forgive you. I will pour out my goodness on you. It makes no sense. That's the God we worship. Man, let that get in your heart. That should bring you joy. Perfect forgiveness and grace freely offered. He doesn't force us on us, but he offers it to us in Jesus Christ. Why joy? Because heaven is our true home and Jesus has opened the way. We should have joy because we know that whatever happens in this life, heaven is our true home, heaven is for eternity, and through Jesus Christ and faith in him, heaven is our home. I love this passage in John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, verses two and three, we read these words. Jesus says, for my father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place and all who put faith in me, all who believe in me, you will be with me forever. And you need to understand, heaven will be more beautiful than anything you've seen in this life. The tastes will be more wonderful and powerful the experiences with people will be the perfect relationship with no sin and no conflict. I've had people say to me, I've had people say to me, you know, do you think we'll know each other in heaven? Do you think we'll know each other in heaven? And my answer is, of course. There's a new heaven, there's a new earth. We have perfect bodies, everything's made right, of course. You know, the people that think, well, you know, heaven's gonna be like this floating spirits, misty in the sky, and nobody knows me. That's Eastern mysticism. That's not Christianity, that's not biblical teaching. Everything is made new and right and perfect and beautiful. And we are with God and with all those who, who have put their faith in Jesus Christ for eternity. And it will be more glorious and wonderful and powerful than we can imagine. Why joy? Because heaven is our true home. And Jesus has opened the way. Whatever you're facing, that's something we can always hold on to. Why joy? Because his door is always open. And he invites us to come close. God has opened the door to be in relationship with him. God is not a distant creator who keeps us at arm's length. He invites us in. And we see this, one of the most powerful places we see this is when Jesus Christ is dying on the cross. 
When Jesus Christ is dying on the cross in Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 50, we read these words, Matthew 27, 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Look what happens in verse 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. Something cosmic, something cosmically cataclysmic happened at that moment. As Jesus died on the cross, he paid for our sins and he took away our shame and he opened the way to God. And this picture of the curtain being torn in two from top to bottom is a picture of God with his own hands, taking his hands and in the temple where they believe that the presence of God, they said the presence of God dwells in the most holy place. Here's the most holy place. Here's this curtain. And then there's the holy place and the temple courtyards going outward. And they said, God lives in the most holy place and only the high priest, only once a year, was allowed to go in there to bring an offering for the sins of the people. But when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain, it says from top to bottom, ripped in half and tore open. Why? It's God's way of saying, come on in. There's no division between me and you. Why? Because Jesus Christ, has made, he was the great high priest. He paid the final payment with his own life and we're invited to be with God. When can I be with God? Anytime. Anywhere. Man, if that doesn't bring you joy, in a world where there's so much exclusion and you're not welcome, you're not welcome, you're not welcome, God says, through Jesus Christ and faith in him, come on in. And it's available to anyone and everyone. Praise God for that. Why joy? Because God has been good, generous, and his blessings overflow. God has been so good to us. In James chapter one, verses 16 to, 7, 16 to 18, we read this. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Don't be deceived. I did it for myself. I earned it for myself. I did it all myself. Now, we can work hard and partner with God and praise God for that. But, but the good gifts that come from above are from God. And when we recognize those and give him praise, that brings us joy. See, God does his part in bringing joy to us. The problem is so often we miss it because we're not doing our part. We're not connecting with God and engaging with God. So how do we partner with God to grow joy led by the Holy Spirit? Growing in joy. Here's the how. How do we grow in joy? Number one, by daily awareness of his blessings. Pay attention. Every day, notice his blessings. Psalm 103 says this. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. And here's the key. And forget not all his benefits. We forget. We get busy thinking about other things and we forget the benefits and the goodness of God. And a lot of the reasons, a lot of the times, the reason we forget is because we're living our life like this. What do you got? What do you have? Oh, look, oh look, look what you got. We spend so much time thinking about everybody else's life. We forget that if we would just see what God's given to us, we could become so grateful. I've had the joy of raising three boys, uh, Sherry and I as, as a team for many, many years now. And, but I want you to imagine, if my boys were like three five, uh, three, five, and seven years old, and we'd order some Girl Scout cookies, you wait till they come, they finally arrived. We did what any sane-minded person did. We ordered some of the Thin Mints and we put them in our refrigerator so they get chilled. And so now we're not chilled enough, so I take out a box of them and I say to my boys, hey, we're gonna give you, we're gonna give you some Thin Mint Girl Scout cookies. Oh, great. So I go to my youngest son and I take out two cookies. I go, here you go, buddy. And he's so excited and he starts nibbling on me. He says, I get to go for his first. He's nibbling. just thoroughly enjoying his cookie. I go to my next son and I give him five cookies. And then with the third son, I give him the rest of the box. That's a whole sleeve that isn't even open and what's left of the first sleeve, right? Now, at this point, now some of you as parents are going, that's terrible parenting. Um, I wouldn't do it that way. My wife wouldn't let me do that. Uh, but, but, but in the real world, in real life, not everyone has what everyone else has. There's some things you have more of than others and some things you have less of and it will always be that way. You want to make sure you never experience joy again? Spend the rest of your life like this. What? What? You got that? What? They, they got that? You want to find joy? Spend your life like this. Oh, God. I got two Thin Mint cookies. 
Oh God, that you've given me this and you're good. And, and stay present in what God has given to you. Celebrate it and forget not all his benefits. Remember his goodness to you. The more you spend time craning your neck and your heart and your mind into everyone else's business, it'll steal your joy. But God has been good to you, I know that. And if you focus on it, you'll celebrate it. Number two, how do we grow in joy? Consistent expressions of praise and celebration to God. We, we, we don't forget his benefits, but when we notice his benefits, we give him praise. So the same passage I read before, but listen to the word praise come out. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Every day, when you notice what God's given to you, when you notice the good gifts, a great meal, a bouncy grandchild, your kitten, your puppy, a friendship, the grace of Jesus, whatever it is. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise him when you're alone. Praise him quietly in your heart. Praise him out loud. Praise him when you're with Christian friends. If you dare, praise him when you're with people who don't know Jesus yet but need to know that there's a God who's been good and you can give praise to him but praise the Lord, express it to him. How do we grow in joy? Consistent expressions of praise and celebration. Are you lavish with your celebration? Are you lavish with your praise to God? How do we grow in joy? Learning to slow down and rest. Sometimes we're going so fast, it's really hard to find joy. Sometimes the very pace of our life doesn't allow us to stop to notice to praise because we're moving to the next thing. We're going to do a series coming up this summer on the Ten Commandments. We're going to spend a week on each of the Ten Commandments, and one of those commandments is to rest. It's found in Exodus 20, 8 to 10. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. One day a week, 24 hours, do something different, do something slower, Do something Jesus-centered. And can I suggest, do something unplugged. If your boss is always tracking you down, then lose your phone for 24 hours. I couldn't do that. Um, I couldn't live without, just try it. For, For the ancient Jewish people, their Sabbath was on Saturday night from sunset to when the first star was seen in the sky, Sabbath began, till Sunday when the first star was seen in the sky. 24 hours. For me, it's Thursdays. That's when I take a day to pull away from, and, and if you try to track me down from the church, tries to get a hold of me on Thursday, it's gonna be hard. I turn off my church, I, I take off my church email. I keep my personal email on, I turn off my church email. And, and you have, you're gonna have to find me. You say, well, one day a week we can't get a hold of you? Yeah, because Jesus has me that day, and if, if I go seven days a week, I'll die. It's too much. I can't take it, neither can you. We weren't made for constant work seven days a week. And I believe the Bible teaches you'll get more done in six days of labor than you will in seven even during tax season. Oh, did he say that? Um, (laughs) All right. Uh, You know, God has made us to work hard, but God has also made us to rest. And if you want to find joy, get that rhythm. And and, and on on once a month when we have our church board meeting on Thursday night, I don't take my Sabbath that day. I push it to a different day. Then I put it back on Thursday the next week. Because I I got it. And sometimes my Sabbath is from noon one day to noon the next. As I try to get 24 hours as best I can to live a different pace and to slow down and notice God's goodness and be restored in the joy of the Lord. Number four, how do we grow in joy? Worship with passion. Make a decision that you will worship God with passion. When we gather together here, that you will worship with passion. You won't be an observer of worship. You'll participate. And if you're not a big singer, then just think about the words, but in your heart, be lifting up those words and glorifying God. Engage in worship. When we, when we pray together as a church, when we're together, pray. When we sing, sing. When we give, give. When we greet, greet warmly. When we're learning from God's word, open up the word and learn. But engage in worship passionately, and God will bring you joy and carry that worship throughout your week. Psalm 84, verses 1 and 2 says this. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2 says this. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. 
When can I go and meet with God? Both of these psalms are about gathering with God's people for worship because something different happens when we're together. I try to worship God every day in some different way, but there's something about singing with all of you that just draws me into worship in a different way. There's something about coming around God's word together that's different. And engage in worship and you'll find the joy of the Lord. How do we grow in joy? Share what God has placed in your care with a great attitude. You want to grow in joy, live with open hands and become more and more generous. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25 says this, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. I don't think it's just more stuff, it's more joy, it's more everything. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Be generous with God. Be generous with his work. Be generous with with people you meet throughout the week. When Sherry and I were actually going to that restaurant, that ginger restaurant in Anchorage, uh, two nights ago, I got out of our car and I was going to get, I had to go, they had like a little machine where you had to put uh, put money in or a credit card in and get a little ticket that you put on your dashboard. And so I go over there and I'm waiting, there's a woman ahead of me and I, said, and I was looking at the machine. I said, can you use cash in that? She says, no, it's just credit cards. I didn't have my credit card with me. And it was a little chilly outside. It was like minus one, I think. And so I'm standing there, and I'm like, okay. And she goes, she goes well, how, many, how long are you going to be here? I said, just two hours. And she said, oh, well, she says, let me just do it for you. And she puts her credit card back in and starts putting in two hours. I said, well, I said I've got cash. Here's, here's $4. And she goes, no, let me do this for you. Let me do this. And I said, no, no, I got cash. Let me pay for it. She takes the ticket. She gives it to me. And she goes, okay. And she starts running away. Okay, that's it. You, get, you have a good day. And I'm like, joy. And then she slipped on the ice. No, she didn't slip on the ice. But, uh, <laughs> she shouldn't be running on ice, but she, run, she just runs away joyful that she could do that, that we could live with that kind of joy. How do we grow in joy? One more thought. Talk with Jesus through your day. All day long, just talk with Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, the shortest verse in all the Bible, two words, says pray continually. Talk with Jesus all the time. When you wake up, good morning, Jesus. Thank you for this day. This is the day that you've made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. When you get stuck in a line or you're at a red light, you ever had a red light and you're like, it's, it just takes, there's no other cars, it just takes, stays red and stays red. You're like, what's wrong? Just say, Lord, maybe you're slowing me down to pray. Just let me talk to you, Jesus. You know, and when you're stuck somewhere in a line at a store over meals, people used to pray before their meals. You don't, have to, you don't have to close your eyes. You don't have to stand up and raise your hands in the restaurant. Praise you, Lord, just but quietly in your heart. Thank you, God, for this. When you're with other Christians, talk to Jesus. When you're with people that don't know Jesus and they share a need or a struggle, pray in your heart for them. And if they're willing to let you, pray with them. When you're with somebody who's hurting, pray for them. When you go to bed at night, say, thank you, Lord. It's been a good day. Your joy is my strength. See, God's lavishing us with good things, even in a tough world and tough lives. And he says, partner with me and notice and celebrate and rejoice and watch how together those things grow us in joy. Remember the why of joy as you learn to walk in the how of joy.